Joining us now from Bleacher Report, from Reception Perception, a wonderful friend of the show. It's our buddy Derek Klassen. Derek, how you doing, man? I'm doing great today, man. It's, uh, well, other than it is like 100 degrees uh, in the Central Valley of California. So other than that, I'm doing quite good, but you know. Isn't that just how it goes at this time of year? When you get past a certain point of the calendar, it's always 110 degrees in the Central Valley of California. Exactly. I I think since I've been back here, there's been like, we had one summer maybe where it like barely ever got over 100 and that felt like an absolute miracle. But other than that, it's 104 every other day. I would never be able to survive. Truly never be able to survive. I I am not built for that sort of thing. I'm not sure I'm built for the series that we've been doing uh, here over the last couple months or so. It's been fun, though, to do a lot of these deep dives on pretty much every single team in the NFL and try to answer some of these lingering questions we have from 2023 that we didn't feel got properly addressed by the end of the season, whether because we stopped paying attention, these teams became irrelevant, one reason or another. But I'm very excited to dig into today's show because we have a lot of high-profile teams in this division, but I actually am more excited to talk about the lower-profile teams in this division. When I went back and started doing this exercise, I really realized how much I was looking forward to talking about the Raiders, and that is still true as we dig into this. So very happy that you were willing to join us, and I appreciate you taking on this sort of work for uh, a podcast series that uh, you don't have any part of. So <laughs> I've roped in like five or six suckers to do this with me. And uh, I sincerely appreciate the time you guys have all put into it. No, it's great. I'm glad you said that though. Cause like, honestly, my, the team I'm probably most excited to talk about here is the Broncos. So, which is not, <laughs> I think going in is not what I thought was going to happen, but it's, you know, when you're in the middle of June and you're kind of delirious and looking for the most interesting things to talk about, that's what happens. Let's start with the Raiders because that's the organization or that's the order that my notes are in right now. So why don't you give us your biggest lingering question that you have from 2023 about the Las Vegas Raiders? The what is this quarterback room? And then more specifically, <laughs> what is Gardner Minshew? Um, because I think what happened last year was we were all so excited uh, with the Colts about Anthony Richardson, right? He looked great in the little bit that he was able to play. I mean, you know, relative to, to being a rookie and all that. Super exciting. And then he goes out for the year. And it's like, all right, we should probably stop watching the Colts. Who cares anymore? This isn't that interesting. But then you kind of wake up at the end of the season and it's like, wait, the Colts are literally a dropped pass away from being able to go to the playoffs. And it's all because Gardner Minshew was able to, to kind of hold down the fort um, for that team. I think what happened during the season, though, is we kind of looked at we we looked at the fact that we got to the end of the season. It was like, oh, the Colts won nine games or whatever. Gardner Minshew's overall, like, you know, your just basic stats were not that bad. Like, they were kind of respectable. And it's like, oh, Gardner Minshew must have done the thing again. He he did an admirable job. And now, like, to some degree, that was true. But you watch him play, man. I, <laughs> I don't know. I think Shane Steichen is, is maybe, like, next up in terms of the play callers. What he was able to get out of Minshew. Um, is, is almost miraculous, like wizardry type stuff. Because really with Gardner Minshew, all you're getting is the quick game, pretty good. Like he, he, he'll he throw it pretty well. Like he's, he's on time, he's accurate. RPOs, great. He can do all that stuff. Anything else, man? <laughs> it was Shane. The second. one other thing I would add is that occasionally you get a big playoff of a second reaction throw. Occasionally. He can yep. make a guy miss in the pocket and he can make something happen off schedule every once in a while, even though he is physically limited. But that's all I have to add to your list. So if you were trying to figure out where the biggest gaps are between what his production looked like on paper and what his play actually looked like and how Shane Steichen filled in some of those gaps, where would you start with that? I mean, I would start with just a lot of their RPO game and a lot of their quick game I thought was just <laughs> really well designed. I think they did a really, really good job of getting, you know, Josh Downs, I think was kind of a revelation for this team because Michael Pittman is nice on the outside, but they kind of needed somebody who could just win really quick from the slot. And I think Josh Downs never had somebody that. like that, like over the last yeah. five to seven years, that type of skill set has not existed within their offense on any of these coaching staffs. A hundred percent. It's been a very, very long time. And Downs was able to kind of immediately be that. And there were a couple of instances where, you know, just rookies not in the right landmark. That's going to happen. But like otherwise, he was able to get open consistently. And I think Steichen did a really good job, whether it was motion, some of the shifting stuff that they were doing, getting him into stacks where he didn't have to deal with press. Like he did a really good job of letting Josh Downs just kind of go to work and be free. And I think that helped a lot. The RPOs was another uh, another big one, at least for the, you know, 
10 to 12 quarterbacks I've charted so far. Gardner Minshew's RPO rate is about as high as any of them. It's, it's like close to 10%, um, which checks out. Like that's just kind of how Gardner Minshew wants to play. And it's kind of what Shane Steichen is used to with, uh, with the offense that he's come from. So that made a lot of sense. I think the other thing is like, they just really, really simplified. The... Shane Steichen knew what Gardner Minshew was able to get away with and what he was not <laughs> able to get away with. And what I mean by that is Gardner Minshew cannot throw the middle of the field. Like on throws when I charted him. So I chart eight games for all these quarterbacks. Um, So it's not like a perfect sample, but on throws in the middle of the field, 11 to 20 yards, Gardner Minshew was 15 of 32. That's just accuracy. Maybe the, the completion percentage was a little different, but that's just accuracy. That's really bad, dude. Like that's <laughs> when you are completing less than 50% of your passes in that range, like that just speaks to me. Like his, his confidence in that area, his anticipation in that area, his arm talent in that area is not good. But they just didn't throw it a lot. And and Shane Steichen did a much better job of like, all right, man, you're just going to throw curls on the outside. We're going to try to let you throw a bunch of speed outs. We're going to simplify the vertical game by just letting you throw like slot fades and and go balls. Like they didn't really throw like posts deep down the middle because Minshew can't do that. So yeah. Shane Steichen just kind of went like, all right, man, you cannot throw between the numbers. Fine. Then we're just not going to throw between the numbers. And they, And I think that kind of like just took away some of the bad plays that maybe Minshew might have otherwise in a more balanced offense. And I feel like the ones they did throw in the middle of the field are almost all RPOs or play actions where you're trying to drain yep. out that area and just give him simple decisions. And so all of this in totality, I think, brings us to an interesting question. Why Gardner Minshew? And why Gardner Minshew at this price? Because that's my biggest concern here with why the Raiders were willing to go out and do this. What is the best case scenario for signing a player like Gardner Minshew and dropping him into the current iteration of the Las Vegas Raiders. I think you only have to go back a year to talk yourself into it. And that's what Baker Mayfield became for the Bucs. You're getting a guy that, you know, is somebody that's been a fringe player, is not necessarily considered a lock starter, but can we get good enough play out of him to make us a potential playoff team? Here's the problem with that line of thinking and trying to turn 2024 Gardner Minshew into 2023 Baker Mayfield. I think it's twofold. One, Baker Mayfield signed for $4 million to go be the Buccaneers quarterback. The Raiders gave Gardner Minshew $15 million guaranteed. And if you look at every other guy who's kind of in that fringe range as a starter, Jacoby Brissett, uh, what Sam Darnold got from the Vikings, it's almost twice as much guaranteed money for Minshew than any of those other guys. I think Darnold was at like $8.5 million and Minshew's at fifteen. It's a decent chunk of change compared to the guys who I would consider his peers. The second problem with this, when you're making those sorts of bets, and I support those sorts of bets sometimes, you're like, I'm betting against the infrastructure here. I'm betting against this guy's last stop. I'm betting against what Baker Mayfield was when he played for those Carolina Panthers. You just said Shane Steichen is one of those guys. I, it's the opposite. There is such a little chance for Gardner Minshew to be better with this Raiders team and better with Luke Getze than he was for Shane Steichen last year. And I just think it's so, so hard for you to get any sort of value on the contract you gave Gardner Minshew in free agency, even if from the outside looking in, it seems like it's a modest sum of money. I 100% agree with that. And like the point about Steichen, it's like, I think if you looked at what Gardner Minshew is and just went, who are the best play callers in the entire league if I could match Minshew with just anybody? It's probably like, okay, Andy Reid could probably get a little bit more out of him. Mm -hmm. Maybe like Sean Payton, like at his best, like could, could get more out of him. Other than that, man, like it might be Shane Steichen who is able to get the most out of a player of Minshew's skill set. And then the other thing that I would mention about, you know, this being some approximation of the Mayfield bet, Mayfield's arm is way better. The, yes, the he was the number one that, overall pick in the yes, draft. He, exactly. He was the first overall pick for a reason. Was it perfect? No, but there was something there that indicated he had some degree of talent where Mayfield is the first overall pick and Minshew is an undrafted uh, free agent. And so I think that even makes this bet an even slimmer chance of being something like the Mayfield thing. So it's just, yeah, I, I don't know about this one. That's for, the for best case scenario. Just when you look at the broad strokes right. as a player, what I would compare this bet to is that you are getting, in my opinion, a slightly more refined version of the Taylor Heineke that the Falcons signed to the contract they signed him to last year. Because that's what you see. Even if there is some second reaction ability and feel to his game, where he, I mean, he makes a ton of guys miss in the pocket. I actually appreciate the way that he operates in that space. He just doesn't have the physical tools 
to make anything out of it. And that's what happens is even if you have some of these backup types that have some chutzpah and that you can appreciate that about their game, the limitations are just so evident that it's hard to get excited about where you can go with that type of guy within your offense. That brings me to the other guy that's in, that is in this room. What do you think about Aiden O'Connell in this mix and compared to a guy like Gardner Minshew? So I think purely as passers, they're actually really, really similar. Um, like when I watched Aiden O'Connell last year, the things that really struck me about what he was able to do, it's like, all right, he'll play on time. I think his quick game operation was really good. There were even instances where like he clearly understood what leverage certain defenders were playing with in, in different types of coverages and was like able to throw away from it. I was like, okay, you know, for a rookie, this is this dude's clearly thinking about the game. This to me is at least a guy who's going to stick around and understand what's going on for a long, long time. Um, his accuracy is not special, but I thought within one to 15 yards was like pretty good. Um, I totally that, agree with that, by the way, his yeah. placement away from defenders good. in the intermediate area of the field. I was consistently impressed by it's, it's little stuff. It's like putting the ball over the right shoulder, putting the ball outside when you have to his feel for where to place it in those areas of the field for a rookie. I thought was actually pretty notable when going back to watch it. He, he plays like a guy who came into the league at 23, 24 years old and is not that talented, which is to say he's smart and understands the ways to get the most out of his body, which again, that's what Minshew had to be early on. And that's what he still is now. I think the major difference between those two, though, I would say O'Connell is a, I think his arm is a little bit better than Minshew's. I think he's a little bit more able to drive the ball over the middle of the field. So if that's something the offense wants to do, I think he's going to have that unlocked. On the flip side, Minshew is a, a better athlete. And he's got more yes. creativity to him. O'Connell, <laughs> O'Connell, other than maybe like Joe Flacco last year, might be like the least mobile quarterback in the entire NFL. Like that dude has cement feet. Um, he looks especially... like Officer Farva, <laughs> and he moves like you would assume Officer Farva would move if he were playing quarterback in the NFL. Unfortunately for him. Exactly. And you know what? 15 years ago, probably not a huge deal. What Today, when literally even the worst quarterbacks can move a little bit, it's 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 a problem. Here's what I would say, though. I agree with you on this. I do think that even if he's a bad athlete, he is smart enough that he understands where his outlets are late in downs, and it does lead to negative play mitigation. He doesn't get set outside of that Raider game or outside of that Charger game. If you oh, remove that, yeah. the Charger game from the stats, his pressure to sack rate and some of those like um, sack mitigation numbers actually looks pretty good for a guy that is an objectively bad athlete. And I think that goes back to how smart he is. I think he understands where he has to get with the ball late in downs when early options are taken away from him. And the mental side of this, you know, he's a guy who has, he has a master's, I think, in business technology from Purdue. He was in college for a very long time, so that's part of it. But I was talking to somebody on that Raiders staff recently, and we were discussing just how much that offensive system puts on the quarterback. It's almost extinct in the NFL now, that Earhart Perkins way of approaching this, this Patriot-centric thing where the quarterback does everything. He does protections. He does mic points. It is a quarterback-centric offense. And the degree to which Aiden O'Connell had a handle on that, when Jimmy Garoppolo, who had been in the league for eight to ten years and had played in this system, didn't have a handle on it, was extremely impressive. So I think the even if he's limited in some of these areas, he does have enough strengths between the ears that I'm intrigued by what he would be able to do. And that's what makes the Minshew thing so strange to me is that you already had a Gardner Minshew at home and you're paying him nothing. So why did you need to go out and do this other than hand waving at we got a guy who's been a capable player in the NFL. Look at us try to compete. I, I 100% agree with that. Like, you know what? If they had to play today, is Minshew like three to 5% better? Probably. And like the little volatility you get from him being able to do some creative stuff might give you a little something that if you need to really overcome a, a tough team, a tough matchup, maybe that gives you something. But again, when you're paying an extra $20 million on your cap for that, is that really like, what's, what's the point? Does, does, does paying Minshew and starting Minshew actually win you any more games than O'Connell? And like, maybe you can say like the, oh, you know, we went out and paid a guy we're trying like that rallies the locker room for some godforsaken reason. But I don't think it does in the case of O'Connell and like this specific Raiders team where it was like, the whole thing last year was like, yeah, the locker room, everybody that was in that building just came together. Well, O'Connell was in that building and Minshew wasn't. So like, even if you want to make the argument, oh, we went out and paid a guy, this is our guy, we're making a push. I just don't, 
I don't think that that's enough to really justify what's going on here. I want to see him play. If it yeah. were up to me, I would want to see him play because I do think that his arm is a notch above what Minshew brings you. And I think his ability to push the ball down the field is a little bit intriguing to me and a willingness to do that. I don't think he has some crazy good arm, but I do think it's at a slightly different level than what Minshew is giving you. And that is enough to intrigue me about what he could be within this offense compared to somebody that we know what Minshew is. We've seen him enough to know what he is. I would rather see him compared to a guy like Minshew who we know what he is. And maybe that's just a bias toward the unknown and something we've never really seen before at a large clip. But I just am intrigued enough by what O'Connell did last year where he would be the guy I'd want to see in there in order to make the Raiders the most interesting offense they could be. I do agree with that. The last thing I'll say on, on the arm, Minshew's arm takes stuff off the table. O'Connell's arm is not good, but like you said, I don't think it takes anything off the table. It's a and great that's, way to frame it. As long as you get there. As long as you get there, you're okay. Let's get to the other side of the ball because my biggest question here is about the Las Vegas Raiders defense, which was very good in the second half of the year. This team was fifth in EPA per play on defense from weeks 10 through 18 last year. Some other stats that I was kind of shocked by 16.3% of opponent drives ended in a touchdown against the Raiders last year in the second half of the season. The only team that was better than that was the Patriots. This defense in the back half of the year was pretty darn good. So my question is how real is this and how much of this could we potentially take into 2024 and beyond? And what I'll say is I like a lot of the pieces that they have on that side of the ball. I don't think they have a ton of stars. You know, Max Crosby is insane, and we can talk about that, just how crazily good he is at football and what he allows the rest of the defense to do. But when they got Jack Jones in there off the street and they were working with Jack Jones, Epps and Morrig at safety, I like Spillane. I think that he's a very capable player. There are a couple weaknesses, but there are guys that when I went back and watched over the last couple of days, I was like, oh man, like they brought back Adam Butler and John Jenkins in free agency this year. And when I watched them play, I was like, that makes total sense. Like they were, they gave them good snaps last year. They have differentiated skill sets. Like Butler has a little juice to him where Jenkins is actually a pretty nice space eater. They bring in Christian Wilkins and it actually makes the interior defensive line room fall into place in a really nice way because he is a star and the other two guys are just nice complimentary pieces. And when you consider them, the three of them together, it actually works. Wilkins is a monster on stunts and this team is really, really good on defined passing situations and just stunting and, and slanting the front. So there's a lot to like about where they are. I think there are questions about whether this can sustain, but when I went back and watched, I was more impressed than I even expected to be with what some of these pieces were able to do. Yeah, I, I think I generally agree with that. Like, I mean, Max is obviously insane. And then even some of the other players, like you said, they don't have a lot of other stars. But the other guys they do have, at least they fit into a role that makes a lot of sense for them. Like Spillane, he can run and cover. Like, is he going to come up and, and crush a guard? Probably not, but he can at He's least. He's undersized, but he can play. The problem right. is that Diablo is very undersized. And yes. the things they asked him to, they th many of the things they ask him to do, he is not equipped to do. I will say, though, that makes, to me, the Wilkins signing even better because Wilkins, over the past two years, dude, what Wilkins has become as a run defender is astonishing to me. He used to just get creamed by double teams every single time, and now he holds his own. He's able to get into the backfield consistently, so I think him, I think he'll buy a little bit more space for those undersized linebackers, which, again, kind of makes this front fit in a little bit better. Like, Wilkins almost has this cascading effect where everything around him makes just more sense now that he's there. Um, so I think that's nice. I do think even though Diablo's undersized, and usually I hate these safety to linebacker conversions, for what he is, I don't think he's that bad. Like, I think he's actually okay. I'm with you like, on that. I, I actually yeah. think that there's more to him than a lot of the guys who go through a similar sort of yep. transition. But, like, they have him wind up as a Sam on the line of scrimmage. Yeah. Like, they're just like... And it, but this, this actually speaks to one of my concerns about this group moving forward, is that I do think that there is a fragility to this. They were the second healthiest defense in the NFL last year, according to adjusted games lost. I, I can't remember who was number one. I think it was the Rams. They were very, very healthy on that side of the ball. You're watching games in the back half of the season, and they have their entire arsenal of guys behind that group outside of really just the defensive tackle room. I'm concerned 
you know, they drafted Tommy Eichenberg in the fourth round or in the fifth round. We'll see how that goes. But at corner specifically, like right now, you're looking at Jacorian Bennett as their other outside corner after moving on from McMeek Robertson. And that's before you get any injuries. The guys they have behind the starting safeties, the guys they have behind the starting edge guys, like what is Tyree Wilson? So I just think that right now, when those 11 are on the field, this is a good defense led by, in my opinion, a pretty darn good defensive coordinator in Patrick Graham. But I don't think they're going to be as healthy as they were last year. And if they're not, you need significant contributions from guys like Wilson and guys to take another step if you're going to be even a top half of the league defensive injuries start to creep in. I, I do agree with that. And that's why I think like the lack of stars hurts because a lot of these guys, like we said, they fit into nice roles. But when you start having to dig into the backups, they don't fit into those roles as as cleanly. And I think that's going to be an issue. I'm glad you bring up Patrick Graham, though. It felt like when McDaniel got fired, the inhibitors kind of just came off. It was like, all right, Patrick, you can go do the stuff that you were doing that got you hired here in the first place. And that's, I think, part of what made this defense kind of find its footing. Because I think before that, it it just felt more stagnant than a, a Patrick Graham defense was mm -hmm. supposed to. It just didn't feel like they were doing as much of the cool stuff. I, I Maybe that's McDaniels. Maybe that uh most even pierce just being like no you have to kick it up i don't know what it was but it just felt like once that change happened patrick graham felt a little bit more free to do some of the stuff that he was doing in new york that was like hey this guy might be one of the up-and-coming you know defensive minds so um I i'm hoping that with like another full off season where he really just has everything off and is able to go do whatever i'm really hoping he can kind of find another another stride as a play, a play caller because I, I think he has something to him i i agree with that so i think where i land is I mean, bullish on just the structure of it and some of the pieces that they have, but I'm not necessarily writing in, oh, this was a top five defense in the second half of last year. They're yeah. going to be a top five defense again. I have enough concerns about some of the, again, the health and it's just some of the fragility to this where I'm not full speed ahead on them being like really, really good in 2024. That's what I would say. Yeah. And, and the other thing I'll add, with the, over the last two years, a lot of defenses have played a lot of bad quarterbacks just because the injuries have been crazy. But they played a lot of really, really <laughs> bad quarterbacks <laughs> over the back end of last season. It was like they played both of the New York teams who just had a terrible quarterback situation the whole time, like Nick Mullins, Easton Stick, uh, Gardner Minshew, who we've already talked about a lot on this show, Jared Stidham. Like, they didn't play Minshew a played lot well against them, by the way, and I'm he pretty did. sure that's why Gardner Minshew is yeah. right now the starting quarterback for the Raiders. Right. I mean, that there might be something to that. Um, they did he have the two one downfield really good completions. Game. He had the oh he God. had the, the one on the second reaction throw to Downs where mm -hmm. Downs ran a slant and then took it down the field. And it, they had a deep shot to Alec Pierce on third and one with like seven tight ends on the field where Pierce was the only receiver and he hit him for a touchdown. Those are two of the only deep shots Gardner Minshew hit over the course of the season. And he happened to do it against the Raiders. Exactly. It scarred them. Uh, uh, to their credit, they did play pretty well against Patrick Mahomes on uh, uh, yes. the Christmas game. So, I mean, it's not like they only feasted on these bad quarterbacks. Um, but it is something that, like, when you, you know, scale some of the, the regression a little bit, it's worth considering. Let's get to the Denver Broncos. What is your lingering question about the 2023 Broncos? My biggest question is, what are we really getting out of Sean Payton. And I don't mean that as like, is Sean Payton good anymore? Like that, I think Sean Payton is fantastic. What I mean is like, what are we getting from his offensive identity at this point? Because mm -hmm. obviously we've seen with Sean Payton, whether it's three different versions of Drew Brees, whether it's Jameis Winston, <laughs> whether it's Teddy Bridgewater, like we've seen him kind of run different offenses and like the bones have been the same, but just some of the, the levers that he's willing to pull have been different for each quarterback. And obviously last year with Russ, the Russ offense to a degree is the Russ offense and they kind of like retrofitted the Russ structure onto what Sean Payton does, which I guess was close ish to what he did with like Jameis Winston, where it was a lot of like, we're just going to get under center. We're going to run the piss out of the ball and we're going to throw downfield play action. And that was a lot of what they did. Um, and that's cool. But I think it was a little bit too limiting for what Payton wanted to be and what he can be. And I think I'm really interested to see what we're going to get more out of him. Uh, next year with Bo Nix obviously being a rookie that's going to be a little bit difficult but that is what I want to see what I will say where I'm not concerned not concerned about the run game like they the Sean Payton run game already is the Sean Payton run game if you look at any split whether it's like counter zone power duo they're not at the top in terms of usage but they're like top half in literally every single run concept they run everything under the sun and I think given the personnel ran it pretty well 
Um, I, you know, <laughs> Javante Williams can be a little bit blind sometimes. I think when you're running that many concepts, that can be difficult. But I think generally they did a really, really good job of spicing up their run game. They ran a lot of 21 personnel as well, which kind of allowed them to do some of that power counter stuff um, from under center that they wanted. So the run game, I'm not worried about. It's the passing game. And like, what what is this passing game going to become? Because I think, like I said, we probably saw some approximation of what was the Jameis Winston-esque offense um, with Russell Wilson. I think with Bo Nix, we're probably going to get something more like the late stage Drew Brees, Teddy Bridgewater offenses, where they're like <laughs> last in average depth of target over the course of the season. I think we're going to get that style of offense. So I I'm curious if we're going to get something that extreme or if he's going to try to find some sort of middle ground here. It's interesting because they pushed the ball down the field as a part of the core identity of that offense, but there were so many throws underneath. And I, I want to say they were dead last in the NFL and the percentage of their dropbacks that went over five yards in the air last year, the Denver Broncos with Russell Wilson, which is not to type that that is very surprising. But my theory on that is that was just a, Peyton just hammering him over and over and over again. Like you are not turning the ball over. You are not turning the ball over. It was just a way to kind of put even more guardrails on him combined with the run game. So even though they were throwing the ball underneath a lot, it wasn't necessarily quick game stuff. It wasn't underneath low air yard stuff that would apply to Bo Nix. It was a specific version of it that I think only really applied to last year's version of Russell Wilson. That is exactly what I wanted to get to. So last year on throws of, Fewer than 10 yards, under two seconds to throw, and taking away screens. They had the fourth fewest attempts. Like they quick game was just not in the offense, dude. Like it, it was just not in the offense. They were not I mean, running. welcome to the Russell Wilson experience. Yeah, welcome to the Russ experience. Like we saw this all in Seattle. Um, and even the, it sounds crazy when you consider that what you just said about like they threw a bunch behind five yards, but a lot of that was like Russ just getting to check downs, or they were throwing an ungodly amount of screens. Um uh, so like, but they weren't actually throwing this like real deal drop back quick game stuff, which is, which is infuriating, especially because like, that's what Sean Payton is. When you go back and even if you watch the Teddy Bridgewater offenses, which I, I, I did, they were running so much like weak choice, stick, spacing, snag. Did you ever see like any of that more than once or twice a game with Russell Wilson? No, no. Even the drop back game was more vertical than that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there was no element of that in the offense when you go back and watch it. 100% like it was just it was such a limiting offense um, and, and I think in a lot of ways we always just look at like average depth of chart target meaning like is this offense limited or not I actually think like the Teddy Bridgewater offenses and the late stage breeze offenses even though they threw the shortest of anybody in the league I think they did a lot more and were a lot more interesting than anything we got out of the Russell Wilson Denver offense last year um, just because I think even though some stuff was taken off the table, I think having like way more options in the quick game, I think that was more valuable than some of what Russ might give you down the field. What do you think is that I agree with you on the run game, the structure of it. And I also like the pieces out front. That was one of my other takeaways going back and watching it. I, th I think Quinn Miners is a really good player at this stage he of his career. <laughs> uh, Bowles is a, a solid left tackle. I think Powers was fine for them last year. Cushionberry got a monster deal for a reason in free agency. Mike and Glinchy is what he is. You know, it's just kind of like, okay. But when you take that line in totality, it's probably like one of the best eight to 10 offensive lines in the NFL. And we saw them for most of the year last year. That group played 95% of the Broncos snaps last season, which was the third highest rate in the league for a starting group of offensive linemen. So I'm actually encouraged about that group, but the run game was 20th in success rate last year. So we like the structure of it. We like the offensive line. What do you think is the gap between those and the actual final results of what the running game looked like in practice? I think it's a couple of things. One, I think when the passing offense is not actually that much of a threat it kind of just allows defenses to to tee off on it mm -hmm. i think that was one of their biggest issues i also think like i mentioned a little bit earlier javante williams is a super super talented player right like he is very strong very fast for his size he's pretty agile he just his vision sometimes is baffling to me like just he just doesn't have that like you would think for someone his size he would be a lot more willing to just bang between the tackles and, and really get downhill and just fight for four yards when there's two yards there, that sort of thing. But he just never really does that. And I think it led to more of a boom and bust running game than I think, like you said, the offensive line and the structure really should have led to, which is why 
I really, really loved the Audric Estimate pick. I, I know was about to ask you about round. this. I yeah. know Audric <laughs> Estimate is your guy. I love him, dude. I know he went in the fifth round. I think he fell for some like health reasons and stuff. Um, but if he's healthy, I, I just think he's a, such a good fit for this offense because Audric Estimate is he the most agile runner? Not really. Like, is he gonna you know just shake a guy out of his shoes at the second level? Not really. But he is a very, very smart runner, and he will get downhill and bang between the tackles. And I really think that to fix the efficiency of this rushing offense, that's all that you need. And, and two, I just, you know, we mentioned Peyton will run every single concept under the sun. Um, Estimate already has some experience with that in Notre Dame. Like, they have a fairly diverse uh, run game. Like, they'll run a bunch of stuff. And I thought he handled all of it really, really well, um, especially for a guy who's only 20 years old. Like, he, so I don't know. I, I actually like the potential of Estimate. Maybe not immediately, like week one, taking over the starting job, but I think at a certain point he can take over the starting job. And then I will say, Julian McLaughlin is an interesting player. He's just not big enough to ever be the lead back, and mm-hmm. so that's going to be the, the the big issue there. Which is why I think they kind of need estimate to step up and be that efficient, get us four four and a half yards every time type of back. So there were enough kind of kernels when you went back and watched that make you that encourage you about what this could look like in a non Russ world, even with a rookie quarterback. Definitely. And and I will say, I almost think because they ran so many different concepts, it can be hard to like find an identity sometimes and really like bang out the the details and stuff in year one of an offense like this. But now that they're going into year two, like guys are a little bit more comfortable with what's going on. You know, maybe some more of the backs have seen more of these concepts more consistently, You have more reps doing all this stuff. I think some of the details are going to get ironed out here. So I, I do have a lot of the degree of faith in Sean Payton and some of the consistency in the offensive line that they're going to be able to figure this out. All right, let's get to the other side of the ball. Mine for the Broncos was what do we make of them kind of pulling out of the death spiral that they were in for the first month of the season on defense? If you look at some of the numbers, they were fine essentially after week five, 17th and defensive success rate from weeks five through 18. And I really think the answer, and this, this isn't going to be that exciting, I think that they just became like a normal NFL defense. Like there's nothing overly exciting about them. You look at the way that they approach things, some of the schematic stuff, we can get into some of the details, but I think it really was just a settling in process that had to happen for a defensive coordinator in Vance Joseph, who was really stepping into a staff and a system that he wasn't necessarily familiar with and was a little bit pre-made. It's not as extreme as what happened when Raheem Morris went to the Rams a couple of years ago and he was truly the only new piece and he just learned everyone else's defense. But the passing game coordinator, I think last year was Christian Parker, who had been there with previous staffs. If you look at the coverage menu and what they were running, it's different than what Vance Joseph has done in the past. So I really do just think that there was an acclimation period necessary over that first month. And there's some personnel tweaks as well, but that was kind of the unexciting, uninteresting answer that I found is that they just settled into being a normal NFL defense for better or for worse. Raheem Morris is the perfect comparison for this, because if you remember when Raheem Morris first took over, it was like he didn't know if he wanted to run more of his stuff, more of the old stuff. Like, what is the right balance here? How do I strike? What is what is you know, what is too much of one thing? What is too much of the other? This Denver defense very much felt like that. And you even see this with some really, really good defenses. Like, do you remember when Mike McDonald first took over? I was going to bring that up as well. That Dolphins game, dude. That's a great, like, exactly. Yep. They looked like they had no idea what was going on. Kyle Hamilton looked like he might be the worst first round pick in the, in the whole NFL draft. Like it looked really, really bad at first. And then guess what? They turned out everyone there was actually really, really good. And it just, sometimes you just need to see which buttons work. And I think they, when you don't have immediately great personnel across the board, sometimes that process can look really, really, really bad. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because that game was in my mind as I was going back and watching the Broncos. I was like, remember how terrible the Ravens looked against the Dolphins? The difference is, and I, th- I think this is a notable difference, but it's not, doesn't contradict the point. That Ravens team was trying to do so many wonky mm-hmm. things. And I think that they just realized their own limitations early in that season. I think the Broncos just didn't necessarily have their identity. Finding the right buttons to push is exactly right. And some of the things they started to do more of, you know, Vance Joseph is a, pressure guy at heart like that's the way that he wants to live and if you look at the first month of the season I think there was a passivity to the way they were playing and the way that he was calling games that is just not in line with his personality they were 22nd 
and early down blitz rate over the first month of the season. They were eighth after week five. And that's even more extreme on early downs. 38% of early downs, they sent five or more guys in weeks five through 18. That was a top five rate. And so you just saw that. And some of that is they're in base personnel. They're sending all five guys, but they were doing some wonky stuff. You know, they're dropping a guy off the edge. They're bringing a linebacker. They're dropping a guy off the edge. They're bringing a safety. So I think leaning into that higher pressurized, more pressurized world is in line with the way that he wants to play. And I'd actually think it suited this defense over the course of the last two thirds of the season. It fit the edge rushers specifically. I think like, well, I think would you have edge rushers who are as small as what, as what Denver has, like they don't have and guys they just who keep are compiling them. By the way, they just right. keep getting more <laughs> they just of them. Keep getting these two hundred and fifty pound guys, but they don't really have like a two hundred and seventy pound like crush the pocket type. Like their biggest guys are like two hundred and fifty five, two hundred and sixty pounds at most. Whereas like you also have the Nick Benitos who are maybe two hundred and forty five pounds. Those are the type of guys you want to be running these sim pressures. You want to be dropping them every now and then. You want to be looping and, and stunting them and doing all this crazy stuff. When you're just saying, hey, let's just get our base guys out there and let them get after it, you need guys who push the pot. Like You need Jadavian Clownies for that. You need a Miles Garrett. I mean, obviously, that's an extreme example. But you need guys who are bigger and can actually push the pocket if you're just going to base rush all the time. I think they eventually realized, like, all right, we can't do the just let these 250-pound guy, guys get after the quarterback guy themselves. We got to spice it up a little bit. And when you give those guys a little bit of, of room to roam and, and, and actually use their athleticism, because that's when you're a smaller guy, athleticism is going to be your strength over, you know, raw strength. I think that that was when they kind of started to hone in on what this defense was supposed to be and where their bread was buttered. I'm with you on that. And Browning got healthy down the stretch. I mean, you yep. can just feel the difference when they understood how to utilize those guys. And again, they drafted Jonah Ellis in the third round. Jonathan Cooper and Browning are free agents after this year. So if they want to play with that archetype of edge rusher, they will need them as soon as 2025. So maybe that part of it is not shocking. The moves they made this offseason, some of them, I think, perfectly align with some of the stuff that we're talking about. They bring in Brandon Jones in free agency for Miami. He was arguably the bl best blitzing safety in the NFL last year. So if you want to live in that world, he perfectly aligns with who you want to be. Levi Wallace is just the second corner du jour. Like, can yep. we just get a competent body out there? Like, he... 2024, 2023 Fabian Moreau is hopefully 2024 Levi Wallace. I get that. Them moving Moreau into a starting spot and dropping McMillian into the slot last year, I think kind of solidified the back end of that defense. So all of that plan on the back seven, even if there are question marks without Justin Simmons, I get how that's all supposed to come together. The front, I don't understand how that's all supposed to come together, right? Malcolm Roach and John Franklin Myers, you're bringing in two physical pieces that I think in theory change the attitude you're playing with and change your run defense. Malcolm Roach is a very good run defender. Who's the nose? in an even front among this group right now? Is it 290 pound Malcolm Roach? Like, I don't get how these pieces are all supposed to fit together. I I almost, they should honestly just lean into the idea of, of, of chaos where you're just consistently just moving guys around and just, I, I mean, this is honestly, the Dolphins did a really, really good job of this last year where they were just creating fronts after the snap. Like, do you know how many times they sent David Long on runs on rundowns? They would just, like it, there were so many rundowns last year where they would have the nose in one spot and, and have uh, David Long behind him. As soon as the ball would snap, they would switch spots and David Long was just hammering a, a guard right away. They should probably just do a lot of that because these guys probably aren't going to just hold their own um, in the middle like that and like eat up double teams. Like you have to make them come off of double teams before they can even get there. I think that's the type of stuff they have to lean into. The good thing is Vance Joseph is, is pretty willing to do that. I think that would be fun. I mean, because what, what Drew Sanders is, is interesting. You know, he played a little right. bit on the edge last year. You know, there's who's going to play now at that second linebacker spot. Now that Josie Jewell is gone, they bring in Cody Barton. So there are a lot of questions for me about how the front seven is going to be deployed, but I think that actually might be the right answer. And I, I kind of hope they lean into that because that to me makes sense with the personnel that they have. All right, let's get to our next one here. The Los Angeles Chargers. What was your biggest lingering question from 2023 about the Chargers? My biggest question about the Chargers was, did they ever really fix the front seven? And did they do it to a degree that matters at all? Um, and what I found, the more I looked into it, 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 it almost seemed like the more I looked into it, the more complicated my answer was. I think the answer is both yes and no. 
uh, <laughs> which which this feels very Chargers that you don't actually land uh, with a like meaningful uh, answer. Anyway. It's the only way this can go. Exactly. Uh, okay, so we all know early on in Brandy uh, with the Brandon Staley era, they were just one of the most godforsaken, awful run defenses that you could imagine. Um, in 2021 and 2022, they had the worst run defense by success rate. It was like barely over 50 percent. They were terrible. In 2023, guess what? They were average. They were at like 63%. Well done. We got to a decent spot. They were still kind of not very good in the red zone. Uh, you know, like, so when teams really wanted to push them around, they, they still could kind of do it. And that was a little bit of an issue. Um, but they did get better at, at, at defending the run. The problem is, I don't think it matters at all. One, I, like, it doesn't really matter moving forward because almost all of the guys that did this for them last year are not returning like of the four leading interior snap guys that they have with where it was Sebastian Joseph Day, Austin Johnson, Nick Williams, and Morgan Fox. Morgan Fox is the only one who has returned. And look, Morgan Fox is a decent player, but he's like a high end rotational, like okay, low end starter type. If he's the only like a meaningful interior guy you're bringing back, you're probably just going to end up back in the same spot that you were a year or two ago where the interior just cannot beat anybody. Obviously, they're hoping they can get a little bit more from, um, I think his name is Otito Ogba. No, uh, I can't get there. Uh, but uh, he he's the only one where, like, maybe they can hope they can get something from him. But, like, I don't think Matlock is anything for them. Uh, Justin Boygby, who they drafted, I think he is, like, a technically a decent run defender like technique wise i mean obviously most of the guys that come out of alabama are but i don't think he's gonna walk in right away and just fix this this run defense so that is my like convoluted answer it's like yes over the brandon staley era they did fix the interior and they did fix the front but moving forward into the jim harbaugh era i don't think any of it actually applies so it doesn't matter it's interesting. I mean, this is a team that did not have a lot of resources to throw around this offseason, right? I mean, they spent next to nothing in free agency. The only real multi-year contracts they handed out were to like Will Disley. You know, other than that, they were very, very cautious in the amount of money that they spent. And you only have a certain amount of draft picks. And so they use the first top five pick on Joe Alt, which makes all the sense in the world when you look at the way that run game looked last year and what they want that run game to look like. Fine you need a receiver somewhere along the way. They draft Vlad McConkey in the second round, and then they use their third and fourth round picks on the front seven. This was never going to get fixed in one year with all of the issues that they had with this roster that was, I think, one step away from like a total teardown. So my question for you is, as they bring in this you know, Ravens-y, whatever sort of defense that uh, Jesse Minter is going to run, though they ran in Michigan, what sort of hope structurally does this team have, even if they have personnel deficiencies in those areas where maybe they can bridge the gap a little bit? I think it's going to be really difficult either way. Like I, I because so much of what made to me the Ravens defense last year was the spine of that defense. This is something, uh, you know, Deontay's talked about a lot. Nate has talked about a lot. The spine of that Ravens defense where you had Justin Matabike, Roquan Smith, um, Kyle Hamilton, guys that are playing in the middle. It was kind of had this cascading effect on everything else around it. The Chargers are kind of built <laughs> almost the opposite, um, especially up front where it's like Khalil Max still one of the best run defenders in the league. I think he was a better pass rusher than people actually realized last year. Like it seems like people talked about him like he fell off and like he, he, did, he did not really play well in 2022. He played very right. well last he year. He played really good last year and maybe not again. He's not what he was when he was an all pro but he's still a pretty good player joey bosa when he's healthy is still solid um the the other rookie they drafted this year was also quite good so their edge players are good but they don't have any juice on the interior and i i think it's going to be like it's almost hard to copy paste the defensive structure of what the ravens were onto this chargers defense just because the front personnel is so 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 different especially on the defensive line linebacking core wise i'm i'm really interested to see what goes on I'm kind of interested to see how much they put on um, Colson's shoulders because mm -hmm. I think Colson is a fairly smart player. I just don't think he's nearly as athletic as the two guys that uh, the Ravens had last year. Um, obviously, <laughs> Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen are about as fast as it gets for linebackers. Colson is a fine athlete, but he just cannot cover as much ground as those guys. So that's what honestly makes this like, you know, the Michigan. Uh, Raven style of defense kind of hard to almost pin onto this Chargers team again 
the personnel is just so so different i think from what we saw in baltimore that it's it's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around what they're going to do up front i'm hoping that the moves at linebacker give them a little bit more sturdiness in that area than they've had in like a post kenneth murray world even if colson's a, <laughs> a rookie you have him and denzel perriman even if it's just competent play at those two spots compared to what they've had to wade through over the last few years i mean i think that there's a chance that we see a little bit of improvement there all right I'm going to the other side of the ball. Mine is very granular here with the Chargers because I feel like I've spent so much time watching and thinking about Justin Herbert and those elements of who they are that I don't have any lingering questions there. The what I what I did come away with is that I wanted to go back and watch specifically Quentin Johnston and Zion Johnson for over the last year. Like what are the last two first round picks from the Chargers on offense and what does that mean for them moving forward? I have very bad news about the Quentin Johnston part of this. It was a disaster. Like I was going back and looking for silver linings. Like, is there anything to potentially hang your hat on here about what he could be in the ways that they could use him? And I don't know if I came away with anything. Greg Roman, I think yesterday was at the podium during OTA is being asked about Johnston specifically. And he said, we're going to use him in ways he wasn't used last year. Like he's not just going to be a full-time outside player. That is step one. Like that is the necessary step one. Because if you go back and watch what Quentin Johnston was at TCU, there was nothing about the player that he was at TCU that would lead you to believe he could just be an X outside the numbers receiver. Not even just from day one, because I know he's only out there because Mike Williams got hurt. But even as a rookie, like that's not who he was at TCU. They set him up to fail with his usage last year. So if you're going to put him in a spot where he's on the move more, he's catching more balls underneath, you're trying to get him yak opportunities, that's the way to use him. So I think that there's a chance we get more production out of him last year if his usage is entirely different. But if it's even close to what they asked of him as a rookie, I think that Chargers fans are set up for pretty massive disappointment. I agree with that. What's frustrating about Quentin Johnson is I think purely from like a movement skill perspective, I still think he has what it takes to play outside. Like I, I still think he's actually, his speed is pretty good. I think he's more agile than a guy of that size probably should be. You just don't like, he. it seems like he's thinking too much every yeah, time he's he, running a route. Every time he's like, someone puts hands on him. He just, it seems like he slows down mentally. Like it just, it almost seems like the game happens too fast, but the athletes aren't too fast for him. If that makes any sense. I think that's I fair. My concern, yeah. though, I think that he struggles uh, against press coverage in the line of scrimmage. Like he doesn't have a oh, toolbox. He doesn't understand what he's doing there. But even on like second and third level routes, where theoretically he should be somebody that's eating up space and at the top of routes, like changing direction. There was a specific play that I'm thinking about. I think it was from the Ravens game where they're asking him to run like a corner post and it takes him four steps to throttle down. And I don't know if that's a mental issue or if that's like a change of direction, ability to sync issue. But either way, every single layer of his game where you would ask him to create separation, he could not do it last year. I, that's why I really think it is a mental thing with him. And maybe in three years he figures this out. But when I watch him run routes and this is <laughs> I was actually, you know, because I was just watching the, the Teddy Bridgewater Saints offense uh, you know, for a different part of this podcast. Michael Thomas was a great example of he just knew exactly when the cornerback leaned just a little bit too much. And that's when he would go and snap off a route. And even if he wasn't the greatest athlete, it almost made him look more athletic than he was just because the timing of it was so incredible. That Johnston has like whatever the exact polar opposite of that is where he just it doesn't seem like he has that understanding of exactly how to abuse defensive backs when they're like slightly misstepping or how to get them out of position, all that other stuff. He's kind of just running routes to run routes if that makes sense which is to your point i think they have to simplify his role a lot and they almost like the best outcome for him or the best way to use him is probably the way that the cowboys used cd like really really early on in his career where it was just very very simplified usage from the slot obviously he's not gonna be close to that good but that's probably the best approximation for what you can do with him i'm i'm even going more modest than that I'm looking at the Rasheed Rice playbook mm. from the Chiefs last year, and I am grafting that onto Quentin Johnston. I think that is the best way to deploy him and get something out of him within this offense because you're not asking a lot of him 
You're not asking him to do anything that's refined or nuanced. It's all like crossers and yak opportunities and just get the ball in his hands, which is, this is the funny part is that I always knew I wanted Quentin Johnston deployed that way. I didn't know that I wanted Rasheed Rice deployed that way. Again, like <laughs> yes, in, in college, yes. he seemed like more of an outside the numbers, like ball winner yes. type. But the funny thing is, the Chargers used Quentin Johnston like I thought Rasheed Rice was going to get used, and the Chiefs used Rasheed Rice like I thought Quentin Johnston should be used. And I, it's very weird, like the fact that that was the end game and the end result, but I do think that's what happened. The number that I was looking at, Quentin Johnson last year of 122 receivers with at least 25 targets. First of all, he was 102nd in yards per route run. It's not great. 28th in air yards per target. It was like 13 air yards per target. The guys around him, George Pickens, T. Higgins, DK Metcalf, these vertical outside the numbers players. It's not what he is. That's not what he is. And the fact that they were he was being used like that, I think it was a non-starter. And I think, at least from what they've said so far, the new offensive staff has some understanding of that. And truthfully, they don't necessarily need him to be that this year. Like they have, so, I mean, Lad McConkey can run, so that's going to help them. But last year, they truly did not have anybody else who could play vertical. And it almost seemed like they landed in a spot where they were like, well, nobody else can do it. So like... <laughs> First round, first round pick. You got to go figure it out. You got to go do it. And obviously, it was it was a disaster pretty much every single time they tried it. Well, they have the. <laughs> this is amazing. Their DJ Chark is the most. We don't have a guy who can yes. run a vertically yes. outside the numbers player. We are going to sign him for nothing and just drop him into that spot. It's probably not going to go well, but we just need someone who could do this one specific thing. So even that is an improvement because you no longer have to ask Quentin Johnston to do that one specific thing. All right, let's get to the other guy as part of this conversation, because this one is actually more interesting to me. And that is Zion Johnson. I, this is why I wanted to do this exercise, because I think if you asked or polled a hundred NFL fans and you asked them, how is the first round offensive lineman for the Los Angeles chargers played in the first two years of his career? Without lying to you, very few of them could give you a good answer. And I I didn't even have that good of an answer before I started watching it. So far, I think it has been a letdown in terms of where he was drafted and what he has been. And you go back and you watch him last year, and the whole point of sliding him from the right side to the left side was to put him back in his natural position that he had played before, kind of increase that comfort level. There are elements to his game that are still enticing and that you can still talk yourself into it he's still strong he's still long he plays an actually decent awareness and pass protection for a guy that's that young and was playing next to a new center for half of his second season my issue with him is that he just it seems like he's not playing with a lot like an assertiveness in any area of his game there's a lack of balance he's over his feet way too often he's on the ground a lot in the run game and so where I land on this is that I think that the infrastructure and the ecosystem for the offensive line for the Chargers for the last two years and the run game was about as bad as it could be, you know, just based on conversations and based on the final results. I am withholding final judgment on what sort of player Zion Johnson is until I see him with this staff, with this version of an offense, and with a little bit more consistency around him in every single facet. I think that's spot on uh, one, because I mean, this, this staff is going to figure out the run game one way or another, <laughs> whether he's a part of it or not. Um, but the other thing is like Zion is still a young player. Like this is only what we're going into year three for him. Like I, yeah. and we're only going into year three and he hasn't been a bad starter. Like he's been a decent, you can put him out there. There are a lot worse guards out there in the NFL. And so for him to still be there and we're moving into a staff that should theory theoretically get more out of him. I think they're in an okay spot, even if this isn't, you know, we shouldn't feel comfortable projecting Zion Johnson. In two years, he's going to be a pro bowler, that type of thing. If they can just get him to, like, moderately above average, I think that will be a good spot. But I generally agree. Like, he is more talented than the production that you get out of him, which is very frustrating. Um, because it just seems like things happen a little bit too fast for him, um, especially in the run game. Like, I, yeah, he is long. He is very strong. He's not a bad athlete, but it just seems like he doesn't take the right angles as often as he should. He can't get his hands where they need to be. Like, it just seems like he's not always sure when he should come off of a double team. Like, it just it just seems like the 
the details for him are not all the way there, which is which it's is a never great point moving you... all together. It's yeah. it's never it's yeah. he never puts it all together, and that's what's frustrating about watching him. Is you see some of these reps, and there were a couple of moments in the Ravens game I watched today where uh, he's getting no help with Justin Matabike, and he can move him off the line of scrimmage, and it's like okay, like when everything is moving in the same direction, like there's a lot to like here, but it just feels disjointed, and that to me it, again it feels like a confidence thing. It's just a lack of assertiveness in the way that he's playing. And that's why I do think that there's a version of him that is a lot better than the guy we saw last year. And part of the reason I'm comfortable saying this is that this has been true for everybody along that offensive line. Rayshon Slater has not been as good as he was in year one when Frank Smith was there and when I think we were all a little bit more comfortable with the overall infrastructure of that line and the Chargers run game. It has been bad the last two years. So this staff, if anything, should be able to fine tune some of that stuff. And that's why I think that there's a better version of Zion Johnson waiting for us in 2024 than the one that we have seen so far. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with that. And true. And I think it, part of the infrastructure thing is like, just look at the players who were next to him last year. It was, uh, I mean, Corey Lindsley for, for part of it until he had to leave. Um, but the center situation was not great and they were not people movers at right tackle. It was a lot of Trey Kip, Trey Pipkins also not very good. Now they're getting Joe Alt and they brought in Bradley Bozeman from Carolina, who is not fantastic, but like he's perfectly fine. I think just having two players next to him who know what they're doing and can actually help move people. I think that should also help maybe even build the confidence with him because maybe part of it was like he just didn't feel like he had the right help next to him. And that was part of why he like his confidence was consistently leaking. I'm hoping getting him next to, to two better players should kind of help go a long way for him. Yeah, it's interesting because right now it seems like Trey Pippikins can play guard for this team while Joe All plays right tackle. I don't really understand that because Trey Pipkins to me is not oftentimes we see that transition when it's like, oh, this guy struggles in space as space as a pass protector, but he's powerful. You know, we feel like they, he'll be able to operate in a phone booth and when things move a little bit quicker. Trey Pipkins' issue is not moving in space as a pass protector. It's that he struggles to move people in the run game. Yes. So I don't really understand how that translates to playing guard. And maybe it's just an OTAs thing. Maybe they're, they're trying it out, but I, I don't like that at first glance. But especially for this team, for a Harbaugh, Greg Roman, like we want to run you over type of offense. And we're going to put him in. It doesn't. It, and and compare Jamari that Sawyer's? and like Jamari Sawyer's yes. body <laughs> like, type. Like it just doesn't really make sense. You have a guard who weighs like 360 it. pounds or whatever Sawyer weighs. I don't actually don't know how much Jamari Sawyer weighs, but the way that he's built leads yes. me to believe that he weighs like 380. Like that is just, he's very, very stocky man. Yes. Let's get to our last one here. We only have one for the Kansas City Chiefs because I don't have any lingering questions about the Chiefs offense. I really don't. Like, what, what would your question be? The the things that I think are questions about this team is how will Hollywood Brown and Xavier Worthy fit in? What will they do without Rasheed Rice? But I don't have any lingering questions from the end of last season. And that's why an exercise like this is less applicable to the Chiefs than it is with some other teams. We paid attention to them at every single point of the year. We fervently documented every vacillation up and down and what their offense was. So we, we only have one and it's yours. What is your lingering question from 2023 about the Chiefs? My question is, so the, uh, the Chiefs defense was really, really good last year, right? And part of that was because they had a very good cornerback in Legereus Sneed. I think by whether it's statistically or eye test, top 10 cornerback in the league, probably higher if you were to just rank everybody out. But is the cornerback room fine now that he's gone? Um, I'm going to leave Trent McDuffie out of this. He's obviously incredible. He is obviously really, really good. <laughs> he was so good for a rookie. He can play outside. He can play inside. He can play the run. He'll hit. He'll fight. Dude is, I think, unequivocally one of the best young cornerbacks in the league already. So he is not who I'm talking about here. Who I'm talking about is Joshua Williams, Jalen Watson, and kind of Chamari Connor, um, who was kind of a safety, kind of their nickel at times last year. Um, but those are really the guys that I'm talking about here. Body type wise, I actually think nothing is going to change because um, Legereus Sneed is like six was like he's around six two, very long, very strong. Jalen Watson and Joshua Williams also are like six one and change, very long, very strong. Like it's it, it, don't, don't think that's an accident, right? Yeah, <laughs> this is what Spags wants. This is how the defense is built. Structurally, nothing's going to change. I'm just kind of concerned about the efficacy of what these players bring statistically if you look at these guys last year they were actually pretty productive like joshua williams if you 
on SIS, if you do uh, players with at least 15 targets last year who got targeted 15 times, Joshua Williams was 10th in yards per coverage snap. Like he was actually really, really effective. He only played 230 coverage snaps, though. It's, it's a problem. And Jalen <laughs> Jalen Watson didn't play a whole lot more because those two traded a lot of time. And then when they were in base, like Trent McDuffie was playing outside, so they didn't even need these guys on the field a lot. So these two just didn't play a lot. The other thing is that when they did play, these guys were press merchants. And like th- this is just what Spags does. Like this is this is just how the defense runs. But like these were not guys who were sitting in soft zones and reading the quarterback's eyes. These were not guys who were playing a lot of um I, this is just they were kind of just getting hands on guys and they weren't really playing with space and they were kind of hoping that whatever spags could bring in terms of the pressure was it was going to get home and they could just buy a second and a half to disrupt the quarterback and that's kind of just how this defense functions um but they're pretty limited when you look at literally any other thing that they were doing and so that gives me some concern in terms of the flexibility of this defense because i do think sneed was able to do a lot more at the same time there is part of me that goes you know what? Spags having two guys who can just beat the hell out of people on the outside is probably enough for what he's going to do pressure wise that this can, it will be worse, but it will probably still be perfectly fine. My question is how often is McDuffie going to be inside versus outside in a post legerious Sneed world? Because if you look at the way that they were deploying those guys, I mean, obviously they play like so much time. It's ridiculous. I mean, that's always how, who they're going to be. But when they were in nickel last year, especially in the second half of the season, it's a decent amount of three safety stuff where they would have Connor in the game. And so my question is, is the best version of this defense when they have five DBs on the field this year, is it McDuffie outside with one of those guys and them being in a three safety look where Connor becomes the nickel? Because it does feel like that might be your best five players just moving forward with Snead out of the equation. I think it it truly depends on how much they really, really want to lean into the press stuff. Because I think mm-hmm. if they're more willing to be, you know, get off of press, play, play a little bit more off coverage, um, all that sort of stuff, I think you can play McDuffie more on the outside. And I think you're perfectly fine with that. I think that gives you a little bit more flexibility there. If they just say, you know what, all that we have are guys who can hit and, and, and uh, put hands on people. And we're just going to let McDuffie play inside. And we're just going to let the corners outside press people. I think that's where you're going to get McDuffie almost exclusively taking over in the slot and then letting the other guys play outside. I do think, I do think though, I, I, I I don't know. It's, it's so tough. I just have a hard time imagining a scenario where Spags is comfortable with Joshua Williams and Jalen Watson consistently being on the field. Like when they go to nickel, like these are their two outside corners. I just have a hard time believing that that's what they're going to want to do. I think it's more likely that they kind of keep switching it up the way that they did last year. Cause I think part of the value in having, you know, sometimes Connor is playing in the slot. Sometimes it's McDuffie. Sometimes Jalen Watson's outside. Who's a little bit better of an athlete than Joshua Williams. Sometimes Joshua Williams is on the outside. Who's a little bit bigger and stronger than, than Jalen Watson. I think part of like, it was almost the sum was or the the parts were able to be more than they were supposed to be what is it uh greater than the sum of their parts because of the flexibility and, and spags's ability to deploy that i think I that's think right they got i think if they got more static that would just be bad so i kind of just expect them to still be pretty fluid in terms of who is playing where yeah it's interesting I, I, it's the moving target in terms of what they are as a defense all the changing personnel that's a huge benefit until you have to do what you wanted to do in the Super Bowl. And that's just, we're going to play man and beat the shit out of you the entire of the game. And even if you can live in a press world with these guys, I don't know if you can live in a press man world Mm -hmm. with these guys, the way that they did in the Super Bowl. So I think that probably is the thing you lose no matter who you trot out there is that even if you have more flexibility in terms of personnel, you don't have that gear that you could go to in that, in the biggest moment of last season. And they don't go to it very often. So I think that's why that they, they'll be able to survive because that was one of the coolest parts of watching them play that way in the Super Bowl. It's, it was against type, and it was not what you would have expected. So I think the version of the Chiefs offense we saw for 21 of their 22 games last year, if that's how they have to live, they're probably going to be okay. All right. That is all we've got. We only had one for the Chiefs, like we, like we explained. So um, that is uh, all we got for the AFC West. We will be back on Tuesday. Fun show for you guys on Tuesday. I don't want to 
it's not even spoiling it. If something goes wrong, I don't want it to not uh, run the way that it was supposed to. But uh, really looking forward to the show we have coming your guys' way on Tuesday. We are going to have the next version of our Lingering Question series coming out next Thursday. We're going to do the NFC West. So very much looking forward to that. But we'll be back on our normal three-day-a-week schedule. For now, that is all we've got. Sincerely appreciate you guys listening. We'll talk to you soon.